Hello and welcome to the CLV Forge podcast. This is the show to help equip you and your church for mission, ministry, and multiplying disciples. I'm Ryan Nilsson. I'm Mike Natal. Welcome to episode eight. Ryan, we made it to episode eight. You shared a statistic with me the other day that said uh, how far the average podcast gets. And you told me that the average podcast only gets past seven episodes. That's right. So our new tagline, we're going we're gonna to scrap the ministry mission thing and just be like the slightly, the CLB Forge podcast, the slightly above average podcast. Perfect. Slightly over the average. Fellas. Hey, hey. You earned it. it I'm honored to raise be on a podcast that proves that you have some longevity. There you go. We're ha- <laughs> And we're happy to have you too. So it's great. You, uh, you've... You've been a source of encouragement for us as we've seen you do your different podcasts too. So thank you for all your posts and the encouragement that we get from that. So let me introduce you uh, since you're looking at this new fine upstanding gentleman here. This is uh, Pastor Eric Sorensen. Uh, he's pastoring currently and serving as church planter of Epiphany Church in New York City, as well as a part-time associate pastor at my home church, Hillside Lutheran Brethren Church in New Jersey. He's married to Missy, and they have three boys, Jude, John, and Lincoln. He was co- He's co-authored two books, The Sinner Saint Devotional and Scandalous Stories, a sort of commentary on the parables. And he's a co-host of the weekly podcast called 30 Minutes in the New Testament. Please welcome in and out burger connoisseur, Pastor Eric Sorensen. All the things that you said in my bio are second to the last thing you said in my bio. (laughs) In and out connoisseur. (laughs) Solid. Eric, it's great to have you. We're happy that uh, you're willing to sit down and talk to us. Uh, about your different experiences with church planting, with podcasting, with everything that you go, you are doing in order to further God's kingdom. So we're happy that you're here. Sure, thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. I'm a little intimidated that you're here because while we're on episode eight, you're on 100, you're on episode 168 or 67. I mean, it's something amazing like that. So I know I kind of feel like you're just silently judging us. <laughs> we're, we're doing a terrible job already. I'm already broken out into a cold sweat. Yeah, we're we're in our third year, I think, of doing this. I mean, wow. um, but you know, I mean, as I think, it's probably well, it's already evident, you know, just being here with you right now. If you get along real well with your co-host, it's a lot easier. And you know, my co-host Dan Price and I are good buddies, and so you know, it's it's not hard to do when you're enjoying what you know. Okay. The, the work well, so then there's that's there's what's no wrong. Hope for us, Ryan. Oh, okay. that is exactly why this is tanking. That explains it. So, okay. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm really My discouraged. Fault. You, me too. I'm going to cry a little bit. Well, let's, let's get into just, the questions, let's just Ryan. Let's the episode. Let's get yeah. through it. Okay. Yeah, we need to move forward, fellas. All right. <sighs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Eric, for, for being with us. Um, I've known you for a long time, and I just uh, love every time I, I get a chance to spend a few minutes with you. And I'm glad we get to uh, introduce you to maybe a few more people. Um, so let me... Uh, we just want to ask you some questions about your experience and uh, just what it's like to be a church planner. Let me just start off by asking you, could you tell us a little bit about your, your spiritual journey? And also because we took so long with our intro, you only have five seconds to answer that question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, but tell, I mean, how did you, how'd you come to faith? What's your spiritual journey? Like I'll, I'll give sort of the broad strokes. I mean, I was raised in a Christian home. I mean, my parents were not particularly active in church all too often. We sort of had spurts and, you know, bouts going to church and then we wouldn't and that sort of thing. Uh, charismatic, I grew up in Vineyard and Calvary Chapel churches primarily. My parents sort of came out of the Jesus People movement, you know, back uh, from the late 60s and early 70s. Um, was baptized as a baby, uh, ironically. So my faith journey technically, according to my theology, be- began there, um, mm-hmm. but was not really conscious of my own faith and would not have called myself a Christian until uh, I was about 15 years old. Uh, by that time, I had, I had uh, begun to attend a youth group that was just down the street from my house. Uh, that youth group happened to be part of a Lutheran Brethren church plant in Rancho Cucamonga, California, where I grew up. And, um, and I mean, initially I had gone to the youth group for the same reason that 93% of males go to youth group, which was to snag a girl, uh, did not get the girl that I was hoping to, uh, attract to me at the time, but did become friends with a number of dudes there. Uh, and the pastor there, Ron Sunwall, who now serves in Great Falls, Montana, 
uh, really took me under his wing and uh, and just discipled me, mentored me, and raised me up so that uh, by the time I was 19, I mean, I was converted at 15 years old. By the time I was 19, I was pretty sure that I was going to head towards pastoral ministry at some point. And so that is in a nutshell uh, how I became a Christian and what led me to where I'm at today. Nice. So you kind of alluded at it already, but uh, how did you get into pastoral ministry? Was there a specific uh, event that took place that really was pointing you in that direction? Did something go on in your life that, that brought you to that point? Well, so I had, um, I had, along with my good friend, Jeff Proctor, signed up for uh, a program called Yes back in the day. Some people in the LB who are our age or older might remember for a brief time, there was a program that combined um, basically service in a local church and also a Bible college type education. Um, the the person overseeing that was uh, uh, Pastor Tim Istabo, who was at one time, of course, pastor here, as you well know, yeah. Mike, uh, in yep. Hills, at Hillside. Uh, and he sort of, um, you know, really wet my appetite for theology. So I was a Christian by then. I wasn't necessarily particularly well versed in theological ideas or or apologetics or anything. And he really sort of influenced me in that direction. So that by the time I I was that, you know, 19 year old kid, I really had I, I found myself just I was reading Francis Pieper's dogmatics and enjoying it in my spare time. It was I I found it to be a hobby for me to read various Lutheran, you know, systematic theologies. And so um, it just sort of made sense that uh, I might want to, you know, pursue this a little more. Uh, (laughs) uh, I heard you. I heard you, Mike. No innocent cough. And I'm just telling the truth. This is true. (laughs) I mean, if nothing makes you more of a pastor than enjoying reading Peeper's Dogmatics, then I think like, you were in, man, if that's what you find enjoyment in. Well, and then there also was, I mean, because of the mission component of the YES program, I was, so my pastor, Ron Sunwall, and at the time, uh, Pastor Todd Matheson, they influenced me to be extremely um, passionate about going to non-reached people in the neighborhood Mm. and in our world. I mean, Mm. so the mission side of that was really, um, you know, fueled by what they were teaching and by what they were doing. So, so I had great influences, man. I mean, you, you have, you know, Dr. Istabo on the one hand, and then you have, you know, this sort of passionate mission driven uh, pastoral ministry guiding me on the other. And so I, I, I've been, you know, led by some great, great guys. Yeah, totally. And I mean, having personal contact with all of them too, uh, that is a, a great, um, group in order to really have both sides converge into what you currently doing, uh, which is planting a church in Manhattan. Yeah. And so like, what, what first got you interested in becoming a church planter? Uh, you know, this goes back probably to, I mean, even before I officially started as a pastor, I, I had a real heart for, again, always wanting to sort of go outside of the church walls to bring the gospel to as many as I could. Um, I, so, you know, I f- felt pretty strongly that God had some of the gifts that he had given me were to be more evangelistic and church planting was the most sort of tangible way in pastoral ministry that you could co- sort of be right on the cusp of that all the time. So, so the interest was there. I had no idea about the dynamics at all, probably still don't in many ways. Um, you know, and that's, a story for another time, but I do. I did know I had a passion to reach people, and so that was what fueled my interest for church planting. Church planting to me was always synonymous with mission work in North America, to the degree that we send missionaries out to international mission fields. Church planting felt very much like that for me when I was uh, just starting out in California, and so mm-hmm. I can remember contacting Stan Olson, and he can verify this for you in my maybe second year of ministry and telling him, Hey man, I I think we should plant a church in the Claremont in Claremont because there's this great college town there. There's four universities there. We don't have to have a building. I'll just hold services in the local park and I'll just preach there. Like it would have been a disaster. It would not have worked at all, but the passion was there (laughs) and Stan was very understanding and supportive of the passion to do it. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. So he didn't laugh at you like Mike just did. 
No, no I nearly yeah. smirked. I believe you were the one who <laughs> laughed, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. And and the tape will come back and prove that. Maybe. <laughs> one of us was laughing with you and one of us was laughing at you. I appreciate and both. We'll just leave it. I need, I need both things. Okay. Yeah. Well, so that, whichever one you needed more, Eric, that's the one that I did. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan, go ahead. <laughs> so tell us a story about how how you kind of prepared to plant Epiphany and, and what it was like starting Epiphany as a church plant. Uh, it was, um, boy, it's a, it's a tough thing to answer because I there's so many dynamics that go into it. I mean from the beginning of the process being forced to make a decision about leaving a church that I deeply loved, which was uh, Bethany in Staten Island. It just, I, I had such a great connection there with the congregation and a great connection with the, uh, with the ministry it, processing the idea that I might be called to plant a church in particular in Manhattan took time and took discussion with my wife, Missy, and took figuring that out. It started with lots of discussion between her and I and various uh, synodical leaders and other pastors about this possibility. Uh, it, was, it was a long process. It wasn't something that we just sort of jumped into. And even after we did, you know, agree that, yes, God was calling us to do that, it didn't mean that we sort of hopped right to it. Like we there was a lot of unknowns. There was a lot of questions that we didn't have great answers for. Um, and so I don't say this by way of sort of, here's my example, follow me. But basically it was almost entirely zeal and passion for the mission that sort of drove us into Manhattan. And then we learned along the way over the next few years what to do and probably even more so what not to do. Um, and so, you know, but initially it was constantly talking to strangers, introducing myself to the neighborhood and doing that for a year and a half, two years, networking anywhere I could, getting to know any organization I could in the city that worked on the behalf of church planting, getting hooked up with the organization Redeemer City to City, which I know, Ryan, you have some familiarity with. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was a process. It, it didn't come, um, it didn't just happen overnight. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. One of the things that I remember is right as uh, Epiphany was getting started, Troy Tisdall and I came out and uh, Troy filmed a uh, video for Faith and Fellowship and stuff. And I remember uh, walking around with you and the connections that you made with people that you were able to recall, and more importantly than what you were able to recall, but that they were appreciative for those conversations. So even as we walked around and we went into like um, a little cafe marketplace, there was a guy there who you'd talked to before, he remembered the conversation, he enjoyed it, and he was just super appreciative for that. So kind of you, uh, your ability to make connections like that seemed like they were so um, important to so many of those people and so appreciated too so that was great and i loved kind of seeing the behind the scenes of that works so that was great no i, uh, I appreciate that i mean i i again I, I i have far more sort of stories of what not to do than what to do but one of the things i don't regret was investing a lot of time talking to the community and to the neighborhood and getting to know people there um yeah. and i i you know, uh, wish I had more time to even do it still today, because I think mm -hmm. that you, you really can find some uh, fruitful soil, you know, as you engage with people on a one on one basis. Yeah, most definitely. I know for me personally, one of the things that I really appreciate about you, Eric, across the board is just your willingness to be transparent. Like, I, I so appreciate that in you. Uh, there are so many people who are uh, looking at you as you're kind of as you're blazing this trail, essentially, and for lack of a better term, as you're kind of being a guinea pig for church planting for uh, what's going on. And I know that one of the things that has been just great is your willingness to share what has been good and what has been difficult and 
uh, as people go in and start thinking about, like, for instance, Ryan and I and the churches in New England are thinking about planting a church in Boston, and yeah. you have been uh, gracious in what you've been willing to share and kind of point out, hey, these are some things that I wish I knew ahead of time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and even your ability to share that, like at a pastor elders retreat or at a men's retreat, uh, and, and I've even heard like at, at a young adults uh, retreat, retreat that you're doing too, but just your willingness to show people that like you are wrestling with the same things that they are and you're willing to be honest with them about mm -hmm. it. And I think that really makes a huge difference in the way that you connect with people. So to kind of go off of that, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned as a church planter that you're willing to pour into other people as they might be listening to this and thinking, maybe I can do that. Yeah. Um, the, probably the biggest, uh, lesson that I've learned is that, uh, church planting is not to be done alone. Um, and not to say that I ever was truly alone. Um, you know, at the beginning I had, uh, Kathy Hagelin sort of by my side who was there to, uh, you know, assist in many ways. And she was a great help. And then of course you guys know my right hand man still today, Dominic Santori, you know, has been with me for, uh, years now. And, but, um, but there was, I think, as a church planting pastor in, in, in an urban environment, it was a fairly u unique thing for the LB to do as a church body. Uh, when we started, I, I felt a lot of pressure sort of on me as that guy, as the pastor. Um, and I think a lot of that can be alleviated if you find a good core group of people beforehand that you can get to come along with you. Some of that pressure that psychologically sort of can weigh you down is alleviated and you can, you can, de you know, delegate and you can hand off things to others and you can, you know, sort of lift everyone up together in this mission. There was a lot of time where I just, you know, I, especially at the beginning felt like, um, you know, I was running full steam ahead and I was just running out of energy, you know, and, and really tired. So, so I think starting off with a good core group is really, really important. I think starting off with a real clear sense of how you're going to fund the church is really important. I mean, that, that is a real thing. You know, I think uh, people need to be aware of that, the church planning, especially in urban environments and especially, especially in Manhattan uh, is expensive and uh, it's not too different in Boston. You know, Boston is expensive as well. Um, and so there has to be, you know, some some pretty good planning before you jump in, just like we would with international missionaries. We take our time developing a missionary before we send them off into the field so that we really feel they're prepared I think we also need to take a similar tack when we send church planters out into the field, be they in urban areas or rural or suburban, whatever it is. I think the task at hand is uniquely challenging and needs sort of unique um, ways of, of training and, and preparing. Yeah, yeah thank I you. I could go sure. on and on, but that's sort of, I'm, yeah. that's a summary anyway. Yeah, oh, that's great. Thank you. And I got to say to you, I just want to echo what Mike said before your openness, your, your, uh, authenticity and honesty, you, you've helped, uh, teach and prepare us for the, for the Boston plant, you know, the lessons you've learned, you've shared them so freely with us. And, and, um, and we've been blessed because of that. I, re I really appreciate that. And I know for me getting to know you and what you're, what you're doing in New York has it, it changed as I came to understand church planting, it really changed, uh, how I view my walk as a disciple of Jesus, how mm. I conducted myself as a pastor, how I mm. led my church. Um, and, and I'm not exaggerating about that. It really was, it was eye opening. And when I, when I'm, when I visit a church and, and uh, talk about things they can do to revitalize and become healthy, one of the key things I tell them is support a church plant, become involved, closely involved with a church plant. Cause as you watch, what happens in a new church, you realize, oh, this is, these are the things that every church should be doing. Mm. And usually when a church is struggling or dying, it's because they've forgotten to do the things they did when they started. Getting to sure. know the community, yep. uh, you know, engaging in spiritual conversations with people outside the church, mm -hmm. blessing, blessing their community and serving them. 
So thank you. And and I know as I direct church planning efforts for the, for the CLB, we will plant uh, in rural and suburban spaces, but we will plant in urban places too. And yeah. before before you planted, I think it was 80 years since we had last planted a church in an urban uh, center. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I just really, you've, you've been a pioneer. So you, you're kind of um, relearning lessons for our whole church body as you go. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for so, saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, um, if someone here is listening to this episode and uh, and they are thinking about planning a church someday, what are some things that they could do to prepare? Uh, I think there's a, a couple of things. They have to have a sense of, of what kind of place they want to plant, because I think strategies are going to differ pretty widely depending on where you're going and how you're doing it. Uh, so for example, you know, like what I did, <laughs> and again, I'm just saying what I did. I'm not saying this is the model. And as a matter of fact, I would say probably in most cases don't do this, but I sort of parachuted into the city. That means that I didn't really have many people beside me. I didn't have many resources and just was like, I'm here. I'm going to take the city now. But you know, that, that, there's a lot more challenge to that. Um, it, you have to decide though how you're going to do it. Are you going to do that? Are you going to sort of do what sometimes is called a hive off, which is yes, you're going to plant a church, but there's going to be a church that sends 50 people with you to the town next over. So similar to what Bethel has done with uh, Fergus Falls and now uh, Battle Lake with, you know, Kevin Foss is the pastor there. That's sort of a hive off model. That's just as valid a means of church planting. And frankly, probably has a higher chance of being able to sustain itself for the long term. Yeah, um, you have to decide what area, you know, you, are you, do you have a passion for rural areas? I'd love to see that, by the way. I'd love to see um, a renewed interest in replanting churches in rural areas. I think that that's uh, often terribly uh, ignored to our peril. I think we need to think about that too. So, you know, plug for the rural spaces, but wherever you're going to go, you have to know that there's a different dynamic there than, than uh, you know, a city or a suburb or wherever it is. And so to that degree, when you've sort of figured out where you're passionate to see new churches then try to find authors and books that talk about what it is to plant in those areas, what it looks like, listen to them to the degree that you can contact them and get as soak up as much wisdom as you can before you make the move. Talk to people that have done this before. Uh, That is going to be your greatest source of wisdom uh, and really listen to them. Don't be young and sort of um, arrogant, probably like I was a little bit at when we started, or maybe a lot bit, which was, yeah, 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 yeah I'm going to do it because I got passion. Well, passion is not enough. Wisdom is very, very important. And uh, listen to those voices that have gone before you and take what you can with within our, our theological spectrum, throw out what you can't use within our theological spectrum, and then try to plug forward. Uh, with the the churches and the systems within that you can to help make that a reality. Great stuff. Yeah, that that is uh, incredibly valid and stuff that I think gets overlooked too. Um, like making sure that you uh, look towards people who have done it. I think that that is amazing. Like not thinking, well, I'm just going to do it the way that I'm going to do it and I'm going to be good and it's just going to work as yeah. opposed to like putting in a little bit of time and being like, Hey, here's somebody who's done this or has attempted to do it or is currently yeah. doing it. What are they doing? That's working. What yes. are they doing? That's not working. You know, that's really important to, to, and I think that that's once again, where you come in, like your ability to tell people, Hey, here's what's working. And we're going to continue to do what's working, but here's something that I thought was going to work, but it's more difficult than I thought it would be. So we had to adapt it. And that's one of the things that's great too, is just seeing the adaptability of things like that you've tried, or even that overall our ministries we've tried to do and Mm -hmm. it doesn't work. And instead of just being like, well, that's it, you know, you just adapt and you try to make different tweaks and changes to see what does work. Um, yeah, I think one well, of the things about being a church planter, one of the things that is different 
from being a church planter to being a pastor in, a, in an established mm-hmm. church is usually when you're a pastor in an established church, you have to, it takes a long time to bring about any sort of change or to adapt because there's, you know, systems that have been in place for a long time, oftentimes even for good reason, that may just not work anymore, but it takes time to persuade your leadership and in your fellow, you know, your congregation that this new way of going is the best tech. With a church plant, and this is true, it's one of the sort of easy, easier things about being a church plant. You can show up next week and be like, all right, we're doing all the things different. And you, you just basically have, you have a lot of flexibility that way, and so I'm sympathetic with pastors that are like, man, I'd like to adapt some things, but it's a long road to hell. I'm like, I know, oh, yeah. I've, I've been there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, yeah. you know, for most of my ministry, I've been a pastor in an established church, yeah. uh, so I, I'm sympathetic with those who say, I hear you, but it takes time. Yeah. So we've uh, we've heard some of this already, but what are some specific ways that um, not only Ryan and I, but the listeners too, can be praying for you or your family or the church plant or even Hillside for that matter that you could kind of share with us that you'd like prayer for? Oh boy, there's so, you know, there's so much. I mean, of course, we're still <laughs> where we're at right now. We're still sort of locked down because of, you know, COVID-19. And so I know I'm sort of you know, isolating the time of this podcast by me saying that, but that is a reality. So we'd love for that to go away. (laughs) We'd love for the vaccine Mm -hmm. to be developed now. Um, So prayers for, for sort of reopening on both fronts. I mean, for our church in the city for Epiphany, it has, it really is a struggle to foresee what the future holds. Um, Just because we have so many people that uh, either currently aren't in the city because when the virus hit, a lot of people decided I'm going to go home. I'm going to, you know, sort of get out of here because of course New York was this gigantic hotspot. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple months when we reopen what the church will look like. And for that matter, I mean, even to that degree, pray for the city. Cause I, I have, I have, I have fairly good reasons. I think to anticipate that the city is going to look remarkably different uh, mm. as a result yeah, of all yeah. this. And I think there's a lot of business that's going to leave. I think a lot of people are going to move. And so what, what will that look like? I, I don't know that anybody's sure yet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Eric. And I just want to say uh, thank you for answering the call of church planting. And it's, yeah. it's rarely easy and often filled with challenges. And uh, I just want to thank you for doing that. You know, the, our city centers are the places where our population is uh, the greatest and the, the numbers are the most, the densest, the church is the most absent. And yeah. uh, we want to change that. And you're, you're doing it. And uh, I just want to thank you for that. Um, so thanks for being our guest today. Uh, you can uh, listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget to look for Eric's books, the sinner saint devotional and scandalous stories, a sort of commentary on the parables. And you can uh, also find Eric at his weekly podcast, 30 Minutes in the New Testament. It's great. I highly recommend it. You can also find Eric at 1517.org, epiphanychurch.us. And you can find him on Twitter at Pastor Eric. At Pastor Eric. At yes, E R I C K. Yeah. Oh, thank you I, for saying that. Yeah, I spell my yeah. name correctly. Yeah. Oof. I also want to say. You say correct. (laughs) Get them both. Is it with a C or a K? Oh, yes. Yeah. Both and. Yes. The the good Lutheran answer. The C is silent. (laughs) All right. Uh, (laughs) Thank thank you, everyone, for listening to our show, for viewing. Uh, You can actually contact us. We have a way. Eight episodes in, we have a way for you to contact us. So you can reach out to us by email. Uh, or carrier pigeon the carrier pigeon is ralph carrier pigeon but if you want to do email it's podcast at clbforge.org that's podcast at clbforge.org so that's the first questions. time i've heard that and that sounds huh? super professional yeah i'm proud yeah. of that yeah that's only eight cool. episodes in now we're not going to check our email until yes. episode 50 right just kidding let them pile kidding. up let yeah them. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to our show. We'd love it if you shared the podcast with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next time. See you.